Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Dr. Dennis R. McDonald has gotten a lot of attention lately, not only amongst Christian apologists, but also what seem to be non-apologists, those who are not uh, trying to drive a Christian you know, paradigm, uh, like you need to believe this, this is the truth, but coming at it more scholarly. And so we're taking a task, something I thought was really worth um, highlighting on Reddit, there's somebody who's actually quite smart and they go by the name, the smart fool. So in case you're thinking we're just being derogatory in the title or the thumbnail, you can scratch that from your mind because the actual person that we're going to be responding to, I thought that their post, while we're going to get into some of the negatives of it, um, I thought it was sophisticated enough and worthy of highlighting for you to pay attention to the criticisms that come at Dennis McDonald's work and allow Dr. McDonald to dissect and dismantle what is being brought up. Much of it's dated, uh, outdated ideas, trying to debunk the notion that Mark might be using Homeric epics in developing his narrative about Jesus. And some of this stuff is worth highlighting on what Dennis may think is on the right track. So without further ado, let's introduce Dr. McDonald. Welcome back to Myth Vision, Dennis. Thank you, Derek. It's a pleasure always. Thank you. We're going to be correcting the fool, of course, uh, taking a little fun jabs there in the title and thumbnail. But we're, we're actually going to be gentlemen about this because I think it's important yeah. people take serious your work and not take this as some joke clown response. We're just trying to jab. Sure, we have fun. I, I tend to be a bit sensational in my title sometimes. You know that. Um, but people people know that this is YouTube. Uh, it's not a peer-reviewed article. We're having fun, and we're yet trying to get people to be aware of your mimesis. So real quick plug, if you haven't, I made the, the poll above. If you haven't taken the course and you've checked off no, I swear on this, it is an in-depth course, 18 lectures. Dennis and me go through... 4K visuals, it's an audio too in case you can't watch it and you want to just be on a walk. You're on a walk, just you're working, you're in a field, whatever. You can listen or watch really high quality and the visuals are amazing too. So me and Dennis go through and we cover several powerful parallels where we see imitation going on, where Dennis really sees it. I'm convinced of a lot of these parallels. I don't know what to do with some of them other than think he could be right about these because I already see that the camel's head is in the tent. Where's the rest of the body is my question. And so some of his parallels make me think that the camel, there might be more of the camel under the tent than I realize. And Dennis is at least trying to give you something there. There's some that I just don't know any other explanation then what Dennis is saying makes the best sense out of the criteria, what we're looking at. This, whatever the pericope is, makes the best sense. So I hope that you will take the course. I will hope that you get the book. It's 27 bucks on Amazon. Um, some countries don't get it. Is that correct, Dennis? That's correct. That's right. And we're trying right now to troubleshoot this, figuring out a way to solve that, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. That's okay. right. So stay tuned. We're not giving up on you. I have friends in Australia who are like, I want to get this. Please, how do I access it? If you are in a country that can access it, I do want to let you know, we go through many of those parallels, bringing the book up visually in the course. So you can get the course anywhere in the world online, but I'm hoping we can solve that soon. And then, of course, you can help us out by subscribing to our Patreon or become a YouTube member. Uh, I just found out, Dennis, that you can actually, if you're in a fortunate position, you can actually gift people memberships on YouTube. I didn't know this. So, you know, if you're staying tuned, I think you have to check off something to say that you're able to receive those memberships. But people can gift people memberships now. So if you're interested in seeing tons of our early access, like I have 14 videos with Richard C. Miller that have not been made public. You can watch those right now as a member of YouTube or a Patreon member of Myth Vision. All right, now to our uh, to to our Reddit post that we really want to dive into. I wanted to start, Dennis, before we get into your critique from the smart fool. I want to read the post that initiated the whole conversation. There's a link here. This link, just to show you, is 
inescapable evidence the Gospels used Homer to create their narratives, Dr. Dennis R. McDonald. This is back when I was in North Carolina. Um, I traveled to see you and Richard Carrier, and we did a deep dive. Richard is 100% sold on your mimesis here. We pull up the examples. This was edited by Kip Davis, by the way. Uh, Dead Sea Scroll scholar, Hebrew Bible scholar, Kip Davis. You can see in the in the comments there. Now, we're here in the Reddit post. Myth Vision has been promoting Dennis McDonald's work about how the Gospels were modeled after Homer due to parallels between their works. While I do see some similarities, I do kind of feel it's quite a stretch to consequently claim that the Gospel writers wrote their works entirely off Homer. Now, I think that's a misnomer. It's not that they wrote them entirely off Homer. Wanted right. to find out the general scholarship position regarding his works on how accepted they are and the reasons for the exception, acceptance or rejection for this position. Thank you. Now, I think it's a worthy endeavor. I just want to make the comment to go and see where scholars think on stuff. But if you're going to authority to try and say, well, Bart Ehrman doesn't accept it, therefore I don't accept it. Uh, horrible, horrible. Uh, investigation kind of method. I would prefer investigating things on your own. Pr that's just my two cents because several scholars have specialties they focus on and they are ignoring or don't even care about certain other fields which focus on things like what you're doing. And that's just, you've been shadow banned in a way. And we're going to get into that. As much as how I love Myth Vision, I feel lately Derek has been trying to proselytize Christians to apostatize from their faith through the phrasing of his videos and all. So it won't be surprising that he would want to promote views as far away from the traditional Christian narrative as possible, consequently affecting the objectivity of the content presented. I didn't want to blindly take in whatever I watch and thought of cross-checking the content with others who are knowledgeable in the field. So I actually wrote and responded before we read that post just to say, look, um, I said, sorry if you feel myth vision has been proselytizing to Christians, but in fact, the Christians online who are teaching from their YouTube channels are not accurate in their arguments. I'm not going for Dr. McDonald's work simply because it derails from the narrative. I'm actually seeing what McDonald says to make the most sense. For a while now, I've mainly only focused on Jewish antecedents for imitations such as Jesus being like the new Moses. Elijah, Joshua, David, etc., Joseph. I'm actually seeing both Jewish and Greek Roman world providing the antecedents. You may want to check out Friday's episode. That's today. That's now. And then they wrote back, hey, thanks for clarification. Eventually, they end up talking about go check out. I have one against Richard Miller. Eventually, we may get Richard Miller to respond. And by the way, you have a fan here on the Reddit post. Nightshade Twin says, I'm not familiar with I'm not too familiar with his work on the Gospels and Homer, but I've read his book on the Dionysian Gospel, the Fourth Gospel, and Euripides, Fortress Press, 2017, and thought it was pretty good overall. I find the connections between Dionysian stories, John, and Acts to be pretty strong. McDonald isn't the only scholar to point out these connections. Facts. Thumbs up to Nightshade Twin. Now, to your dissenter, and someone who claims to be somewhat of a fan, The Smart Fool. Yeah, I mean, you are better off. This is referring to the person who was talking about myth vision and bringing your work up. You are better off listening and reading books by actual scholars who aren't driven by their ideology and who are not still sadly recovering from religious trauma. There is a reason why most scholars haven't accepted his thesis of Mark being directly influenced from Homer. Scholars are more likely to see indirect, if anything, or really just Mark using common tropes uh, and rhetoric of the day. Before we go any further, Dennis, I want to give you the chance to respond to that opening before we even start reading what he says. Uh, thank you, Derek. Um, smart fool. I'm going to call you that if that's your your uh, uh, persona name. That jab at my uh, religious trauma is entirely unfair. I did not have a religious trauma. I had religious growth, and sometimes the uh, it just became clear to me that I needed to have an intellectual awakening because things that I was seeing 
um, that were done in the name of the Christian church. And it continues. I want also to say I have never advocated anyone to apostatize from Christianity. I spent my career in Protestant seminaries helping students to become better pastors and to understand the Gospels more sympathetically and more profoundly. Now, the other thing is, uh, I have never been called not a scholar since I graduated from Harvard. And I've taught in major universities. I have 14 publications, uh, books to my, my credit. Uh, I'm a member of uh, academic societies. I don't know what you want. I was a director for 10 years of the Claremont Institute for Antiquity and Christianity. So um, you can't say I'm not an actual scholar. And I would appreciate a public apology. Thank you, Dennis. That's, that is not the way academics work. Now, you can disagree with um, my academic work. That is perfectly fine. And scholars do that all the time. And we none of us gets it right. So the importance is the discourse. Mm -hmm. But discourse doesn't work if you're name calling. Now, I'm going to make uh, have some fun with your smart fool piece because I grant that you're smart, but I also think you're uneducated about some things, and I'd like to try to educate you and others about that. And By I the just, way, you, I, you mentioned that lots of scholars don't like my work. That's right, and that's true for almost all uh, breakthrough um, uh, 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 uh positions in the guild. But I mm. want to give you, uh, Derek, I don't think I've done this with you. The Anchor Bible Dictionary is a primary, it's six volumes, a uh, beautiful work of um, uh, resources as an encyclopedia on the Bible. I want to read you their uh, entry on Homer. See weights and measures. Homer is a Hebrew word for a bushel, a, a weight. There is no reference at all in these six volumes to Homer. There's none to classical Greek literature. There's none to Virgil, who's the most important author during the time of the New Testament writings. Now, tell me there's not a problem in the field. And it's just widespread ignorance. And uh, I've written frequently about why you have this ignorance, and it's lamentable. I cannot any longer excuse the ignorance of the guild. It's intentional. It's a part of the DNA of the Society of Biblical Literature and other places where I still have memberships and still get involved. But... Um, Yes, it's true that scholars don't like my work, but I think there's a lot of laziness and jealousy involved. Dennis, I, I just want to add the comment to say, um, I think, and I'm hoping, that uh, some of the people in that group are hoping to put an AMA with you together. And of course, I know you want an apology because that's that was a poisoning of the well. Um, not even granting you the opportunity of just bringing the critiques rather than trying to say, look, this guy's got religious trauma. Um, as far as my own psychology, for me, um, I'm sure probably there's something there in terms of bitterness towards the ideology because of how it made me hate myself, hate my flesh, these kind of war on myself, um, which is just built in inherent in the New Testament uh, literature. I mean, it's there to hate the flesh, to hate the world, to love. And, and that was my interpretation of it. The same way Ignatius was writing the letter to the Romans about going to death. He wanted to die so that he can gain life. So that was my understanding. And so, yes, I must admit, partially that awakening you're describing is also that bitterness. So maybe there's some trauma there for me. But I would also add, it's also that awakening there for me, waking up, realizing how ridiculous. And so if you find any ax grinding, any bias, any, any type of animosity toward the, to the ideology, 
Look, if you're a Christian and it's working for you and it gives you peace and it gives you love and it gives you harmony and you're great, you're not living your day to day like Paul seems to be saying, hating the flesh. You're not imitating Paul in that respect. Cool. Good for you. Keep it up. I don't have any care in the world. But if you're running around telling other people and you're trying to monopolize the world with your religion, I'm coming back. I'm kicking back. I'm fighting back against those who want to push this ideology onto others, telling them they're going to go to hell. This is a motivated part of my reasoning that is there. That might soften over time as I start to grow up and mature and not have that. But um, I just want to say I think there's a bit of awakening on my end as well, Dennis, and it's not just trauma. So yeah, uh, 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 I honor that, you know, and we've talked about it personally quite a bit. So, and I know that your viewers are, um, some of them have that same experience. That wasn't my experience exactly. But I want to say one of the reasons that I think mimesis needs to have a place in the Christian discourse, as well as among uh, atheists or agnostics, if I'm right about mimesis, and you know this from um, the, the times we've spent together, yeah. these authors are trying not to steal from classical Greek poetry and Homer. They're trying to culturally transform it right. to make it more compassionate and compelling. And to uh, give Jesus, the historical Jesus, I suppose, uh, or at least the memory of Jesus, a stature that makes him competitive in the religious world of the early Roman Empire and uh, evoking the, uh, the, the fortunes of uh, Greek poetry. But it also, what people don't see is most of my work actually is on the Q document and the Jewish understanding of uh, Jesus in uh, prior to the Jewish war. And I have a major work that's coming out um, called Homer and the Quest for Q and Jesus. My synopsis has more on Q than it does on Greek poetry, perhaps, hmm. except in the first chapter anyway, the first the one uh, that's volume. coming up. Uh, yes. Well, no, in the synopsis itself, okay. yeah. you have uh, the, the, the Logoi of Jesus or my reconstruction of, of Q actually gives the structure of the synopsis itself. It follows the my reconstruction of the Q document. Now, the Q document is difficult to restore. There's no doubt about it. And I am sure that I didn't do it precisely. Just to but, show people like you'll have side by side. You know, you'll have your uh, your logoi, the sayings, yeah. and then uh, Mark, which this just has no Mark here because there's nothing there on it. And then there's Matthew and there's Luke. Anyway, just to show people. And the, these texts are not stealing. They're culturally engaging. And that adds the richness uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the richness of the conversation. So I want I'm glad we had a chance to talk about this before looking at further at some of the leg legitimate criticisms that yeah. uh, the smart fool advances, and then we can engage those. I just wish that wasn't part of what they wrote. It was like, and, and notice, I do want to highlight, let's pull it up because I'm going to continue. I just want to highlight one thing for anybody on Reddit, right? This person who's writing is, is actually, you could tell, very learned, okay? I don't know who they are, and I'm glad. I'm just giving you their name and why I titled it this way, just being funny, playing on it. But there's 42 ups, right? So you have a lot of people who are going, yes. In fact, giving the sources for those who don't want to read what it is, they, they shorten it. Did you study all this in school? Your comment is enlightening, okay? So, so people are being influenced. They're being persuaded, so to speak, because of his sophistication in the writing, Thanks for this. It is very helpful. Do you know any sources that directly interact with McDonald's work? Also, do you know of any good sources directly interacting with his Dionysian gospel hypothesis? And of course, they bring up uh, Fergus King. And uh, anyway, it goes on and on. So let's read what they say. And then if you want, do you want to pause me and respond? Or do you want me to just read through it all? And then I'll, you respond. I'll pause you occasionally. Yep. Interrupt me in it. I will not consider it rude. All right. There are... There is a reason why most scholars haven't accepted his thesis of Mark, specifically notice Mark, 
being directly influenced from Homer, scholars are more likely to see indirect, if anything, or really just Mark using common tropes and rhetoric of the day. First, MacDonald argues that it is very plausible that Mark would have received a classical education, according to MacDonald. He contends that Mark's gospel fulfills the criteria characteristic of literary mimesis as carried out by classically educated Greek writers of the era. Okay, I want to uh, interrupt there. Mm -hmm. He is right that most scholars um, don't accept this, so that's fair enough. Um, but to be exposed to Homer doesn't mean you had an advanced education. You were exposed to Homer as soon as you went to school. One of the we have exercises that indicate that the first sentence that people wrote was Homer is not a man but a god. You learned how to craft your letters after the Homeric names. Um, um, Jacques uh, Bompere, um, the famous uh, classicist, said. As soon as a boy entered school, he was engaged in mimesis with Homer. So the idea that you only in the ancient world were exposed to Homer in advanced stages is really ridiculous. And it really is ignorant because we know that Homer was the primary way that people learned to write. Now, some people did it better, other people did not, um, but we, the, <laughs> the, the, you didn't respond to my business about the Anchor Bible. Isn't that amazing? There, yes. You, yeah. you, a bushel uh, measure gets mentioned, and the greatest poet and, uh, in, <laughs> and, and author of classical antiquity does, does not. It's, it's, there's... I feel that there is this kind of apologetic in a way that seeps in and even in, and I'm not trying to paint that all scholarships like this, but you, you got to imagine when you have what happened in world war two in Nazi Germany, and there seems to be a sympathetic response reacting to what happened to Jewish people. And we're trying to have ecumenical interfaith dialogue and trying to really make up for what the church has done in terms of anti-Semitism. Yeah, absolutely. There is this overreach, I think, of like everything's got to be so Jewish to the point where they're not Hellenized to the core, to the point where Yahweh Zeus, I mean, we're talking about they're literally fusing the deity of Zeus and Yahweh together. I mean, this is how far Hellenized Jews were at this time. To know who, whether the authors were Jews or Gentiles sympathizing with Jewish concepts or Jews sympathizing with Gentile concepts. Well, the, and I know many Jewish scholars who say that that um, appropriation of Judaism to understand the New Testament does no favors to Judaism because they know that what he'll have in the New Testament is not a linear and tidy development of the fortunes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And in a way, the interest in, and I think you're exactly right, this overreaction to the embrace of Judaism because of the Holocaust is not doing a favor to Jews um, in their understanding. I've given lectures in synagogues and people say, I am so grateful for your work because I no longer have to deal with my office mates who say that if I really understood their Bible, I'd become a follower of Jesus. Right, right. Um, so it, that's a, it's a dangerous um, issue, actually. Yeah, either way, right? Catch 22, because if you go full on that, you know, this isn't, it has no Jewish to it at all. And it's just a jab at Jews and how they really screwed up. And that the true inheritors of Israel and the promises are these non Jew Christians who follow the Christ, right? Um, you have extremes on both ends, but it's interesting in that introduction, Anchor Bible introduction, the fact that they're not mentioning the Greek literature or even Verge or any of that. Uh, what? <laughs> like, it, it, it's just that same, we got to look for Jewish antecedents only. And in fact, yesterday, we're going to be pulling up the Testament of Abraham and how important this is. And I don't want to give away your thunder yet because you're going to highlight something that I think is powerful in the critiquing the critique. But it's Dell Allison Jr. who wrote the commentary on that that I, that I have 
on the Testament of Abraham. And I've spoken to him, and his training is only on the Jewish antecedents. They look only at Jewish stuff. He learned Greek in the 70s. He said, Dennis could be right, and I would never know because I've never been trained or, yeah, or took right. the time to study it. And that's a fair answer, but it tells you the state of scholarship. Yeah, they're it does. only looking at they're looking with one eye open, like you're we named the course looking at the Greek with one eye open, you know. Um, they're only looking at the Jewish side with one eye, not looking at both sides together. Of course, I'm blind in one eye, so I identify <laughs> with that image. Well, shout out to Imnag on the super sticker. Thank you for being here in the chat. I love you, man. Thank you so much for that support. Continuing, Dennis. Yeah. However. There is significant problem to his thesis. This is your thesis. McDonald does not adequately address the counterclaim, which is that Mark's marginal socioeconomic status and his poor grammatical skills would have made a classical education unlikely. McDonald dismisses this argument, citing David Rhodes and Donald Mitchie, who argue that Mark was a sophisticated literary composer. However, to be able to tell a good story is a far cry from employing the skills mastered through formal study of the classical texts of Greek antiquity. In fact, the style of Mark's Greek, which is not part of the analysis of Rhodes and Mitchie's narrative criticism, as well as Mark's social status, cast doubt on the assertion that Mark could have been the kind of sophisticated literary composer that MacDonald depicts. Okay, very, very quickly. Um, Mark's grammar is is rustic and difficult um, to read because it is not elegant. And Matthew, but particularly Luke, improves on it. So I have no argument with that. The issue is whether uh, an author would be exposed to the Homeric epics only in advanced rhetorical education. And that is not the case. And we that's where... Later on, we'll take a look at the Testament of Abraham okay. and see an example of somebody who's just having a lot, a Jewish author who's having a lot of fun with Homer in order to make, um, uh, a, 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 have fun with the, pen, the Pentateuch. So simply put that we're going to cover this, but it's this author's writing in a rustic kind of uh, way in Greek, not yeah. high sophisticated like Luke Acts. Um, and also, though, we have the socioeconomic, and we're going to dive into this more. We'll get as, into the, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this yeah. is important. Okay. Here we go. To counter this, Dennis argues, one can no longer assume that Marcus was rusticus. He does concede, however, that even hoi poi, is how do you pronounce that? Hoi poloi. Hoi poloi, soaked up narrative poetry. In making this claim about hoi poloi, McDonald argues that ancient Greeks were not exposed to Homer exclusively from texts. That's true. Notice the problem here. When arguing against theory of indirect influence, McDonald rejects indirect influence in favor of direct. But when acknowledging the evidence against Mark having had access to classical education, McDonald seems to be making an argument for indirect influence. Okay, this is not a problem at all. I've not. I've never argued against indirect influence of Homer on the on education or or on the culture. The pro, but it, uh, sometimes the an author actually is consulting a text to uh, to imitate. So uh, he can't expect that his readers are going to know the uh, the epics by heart or to have uh, read them recently. So having it available in the culture in a widespread way is what he's counting on. But for his own composition, he actually has a text and we'll we'll have some examples of it. OK, and just everybody who's super chatting, thank you for the support and your super chats. We will get to those when we're done critiquing here. Okay, um, McDonald thinks that Mark was a Christian elite, but in the first century, but in first century, Christian elite was far different than a social elite. During this period, high Christian status did not necessarily translate into high social status vis-a-vis -vis the larger Greco-Roman world. To demonstrate Mark's affinity with those of lower social status, note 
that Mark's gospel shows great sympathy toward those who occupied the social margins under the Roman imperial system. Both Jesus' teachings within Mark and Mark's narrations about the groups of people who followed Jesus describe people without adequate food to eat. The little ones, most likely including day laborers, peasant subsistence farmers and fishermen, the sick and disabled, and slaves. Political and economic references in Mark's gospel, all from the social margins, also point to Mark's marginal social economic status. Themes that reoccur in Mark include taxation, tenant farming and debt slavery, economic exploitation, and greed. These are not the concerns of social elites, but of those who identify with the social margins. Mark rejects even such basic status identifiers as kinship, and he rejects the status claims of those who like to walk around in their long robes and be greeted in the markets and to have the premier seats in the synagogues and at the banquets. Mark's affinity for the people of Galilee, a region known for its hostility towards the Roman occupation, his animosity toward the Jewish leaders and collaborators of Rome, and his distinct neglect for the well-established urban centers in the Galilee in favor of the villages, all point to a status of social marginalization and resistance to the accepted status markers of the Roman occupation. Okay, two issues are so important. One is that concern for the poor is not a marker of one's own social identity. It, take a look at, the, uh, at Luke Acts. Luke Acts is written by a Christian and a cultural elite. And he, that author has more concern for the poor than any other author in, of the Gospels. So um, actually, you can see this with John Chrysostom. Uh, 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 Peter Brown has done lots of work in uh, Christian uh, sermons and discourses where it's a part of the rhetoric of the morality of these texts. And to identify um, a concern for the poor with the author being himself poor is really a huge gap. Now, I don't want to get too far into the Q document, but in my view, Mark knows Q intimately. And if you remove the mythological layers that are in the Gospel of Mark, what you find is a document that is the place where you find most of the Galilean material, most of the concern for the poor, par parables about slaves, and so on. So, um, uh, again, I'm not going to convince many people that you have Mark knowing Q and that that material comes from there, but that's where I am. Now, if we believe that, um, um, uh, what's his name? Mason. Um, Steve Mason. Steve Mason. Yeah. If we trust him, Galilee was not the center of resistance to Rome. It was in Judea that you had the problems. And so the idea that you'd have, uh, uh, you know, a, a Jewish peasant uh, in, the, the, in the north carrying on this way is, is really fatuous in my view. But the, the biggest problem is the notion that when you have a text that's concerned about the poor, that it's written by the poor. That simply is not the case. It, it, even in, in the history of Marxism, you can see that it's intellectuals that had more concern about the poor than the poor themselves. Interesting. So this is a non-argument, technically. I mean, it's it's one could try to make a case, but there is no connecting those dots and making the case against what you're suggesting at this well, point. It's a part of the rhetoric, and it can come from people who are marginal, right. but it doesn't need to come from people who are marginal. So there are other social identity indicators that uh, that help uh, other than just a concern for the socially marginal. Got it. So at this point, what it sounds like what's happening, Dennis, as we're getting into this deeper, is that, look, the grammar sucks. The guy's concerned about the poor so much. He's probably poor. How could you even think? And you've already explained that it isn't even the social elites and their education that is talking about Homer. Right. Even the non-social elite education was discussing Homer, teaching Homer. People had to immerse themselves with Homer. So at all levels of education, Homer is finding its way in it. 
So you already tackled that. You're already tackling the idea that this doesn't have to be a poor author who's, you know, uh, also identifying in those social economic margins. And then also you're saying you grant that it's kind of rustic. The grammar is not the best here. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we now, can discuss a little more about why. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but um, I would like to hear you answer this question. Mm -hmm. What would Robin Faith Walsh or Richard C. Miller say about the notion that the gospel authors are uh, are, are simply peasants and uh, and not greco-roman elites their work <laughs> is so important in right. catching on not just about who the authors were but why new testament scholars are insistent on making these kinds of judgments about the uh, the limitations of gospel authors uh, they were much more sophisticated than we are that's what both of them would say, um, and of course you agree with that. Um, and some would even argue that Mark's purposefully writing his grammar in this manner. I I, I don't know uh, what the answer to that I, is. I, I, but, I, you know, you know, I don't think people do that. No, I'm just saying there's some people yeah. who no, no I, I, this argument. I, of course, uh, yeah. But I would agree with you. Um, th this is coming from more educated people, and both of them would echo what you're saying there. It's really interesting. And you know what? Before we continue, Dennis, this is an interesting point to highlight something. Christians who may be watching this, do you want your authors to be dumber <laughs> just so you can somehow, I don't know, is this winning an argument for you? Are you willing to say my saints and the authors of my literature were just dumb or not as smart? Or are you wanting to say these are smarter people? Christians were not dummies. I mean, you, you kind of have a pickle here, right? I'm going to think that you're actually giving more credit to Christians and Christianity with your argument here. These are smart, uh, there, smart there's people. There's no doubt about it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So whose side do you want to be on? The ones who want to say these are dummies or the ones that are saying, actually, these are really, really well, smart Well, the people. opponents are going to say they're dummies who are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was smarter than all of us. Of course. <laughs> That's what I was getting at. But uh, <laughs> thanks, Dennis. Let's continue. All right. As David F. Watson notes of Mark's Jesus, in the marketplace of elite ambition, Jesus' claims would seem utter nonsense given the concentration of themes, characters, and terms that ascribe honor to people of low status and reserve scorn for those in the upper classes. A strong scholarly consensus locates Mark not as an elite, but as a subaltern and thus unlikely to have access to or even to have desired the classical education sought after by ancient Mediterranean elites. Again, I say read Robin Faith Welsh and, and Richard Miller. Um, that really is um, a very dated argument and does not take into account the literary sophistication of, of the Gospel of Mark, for example. Okay. Then in 2011, Albert Hogaturb, forgive me for butchering that, performed a sociolinguistic analysis of Mark's Greek and reaffirmed the conclusions of Adolf Deisman that Mark's Greek represents a sociolinguistic product of the lower classes of bilingual Greek Aramaic speakers. Watson added that for Greek literary elites, the commonest offenses were barbarism and solecism, neither of which, adds Watson, is uncommon in Mark. Examples of Mark's sole solecistic or ungrammatical Greek include indiscriminate interchanging of verb number and tenses, run-on sentences connected by what H.B. Sweet, 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 I'm going to just say, calls the, Sweet, sim yeah. the simplest of Greek copulas, endless repetition of adverbs such as immediately, as well as clumsy, inelegant, and awkward transitions, narratives, and the use of literary conventions. What we have here isn't an author who is culturally elite or someone who is writing to that audience. Scholars are usually more open to Luke Acts being influenced by some Homer because Luke is seen as more of a literary elite. And yeah, again, have. I would say <laughs> the authors uh, are assuming that um, Homer's place in society was similar to what Shakespeare is for us. Mm -hmm. You get exposed to say Shakespeare in college, perhaps a little bit in high school, but you really can't ex uh, understand it well and, unless you get a graduate degree. 
Mm. In, the, in the Greek world, you exposed to Homer right away. It was what gave cultural definition. So um, I'm going to um, it kind of summarize his arguments by having you put up on the screen, if you could, Yes. The, the part that talks about denial, uh, the criteria of mimesis criticism, okay. and my alternative logic. Can you find that? Uh, criteria, yep, I do have it. Let me share my screen here. Bear with me. And we got some wonderful super chats, by the way, just to excite you, Dennis. There's some good stuff coming. So uh, I hope that we have some sophisticated, continuous sophisticated conversation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to have you do some reading. Oh, I'm with you. Okay, so th these categories come from uh, Thomas Kuhn's um, famous book on the structure of scientific revolutions. And uh, scientific revolutions uh, happen because there are anomalous facts that challenge the uh, paradigms of mm -hmm. um, intellectual guilds. And there are lots of ways of trying to manipulate the science in order to make it um, to account for these alternative um, understandings. Oh, Darwin did it in terms of evolution, and right. uh, Newton did it in terms of gravity, and so on. So um, the first thing one does with um, these uh, unfortunate facts or these anomalies is to deny they exist. So if you'd read them, literary parallels. Yep. Literary parallels between Greek poetry and the Gospels do not exist. Carl Olaf Sanez, for example, insists that the evangelist and their readers were insufficiently literate for strategic and hermeneutically fright freighted imitations to be meaningful. If one accepts Sanez's dictum, it matters not how many parallels one draws between classical Greek poetry and the Gospels, how sequential they are, or how distinctive. Mimesis becomes moot and its practitioners moot. You don't even have to deal with the parallels. And that's true of the smart fool. That's exactly he doesn't what give, yep. he doesn't give any examples or give an alternative explanation for the parallels. So you just say they don't exist. So if they don't exist, then uh, scientific guilds suppress information about them continue since these yeah since these literary parallels do not exist one may ignore and silence those who say they do more than once a publisher has refused to print positive reviews of my books in one case because my research was not sufficiently jewish so uh we've talked about that before now in some cases scientists will recognize that you may have a um a one-time um inconvenient fact or an anomaly to the going uh, paradigms of the science. And in order to account for that, they uh, use accommodation. So read that paragraph, would you? Even if such parallels do exist, they are not mimetically intertextual, but dynamically intercultural. M. David Litwa, quote, if imitation occurred, it did not occur in this bookish fashion. There were many more common ways for people in antiquity to absorb and adapt cultural lore, end quote. Traditional historical criticism thus will suffice. Now, Litwa is very bright, very well learned, and I don't deny that you have a Homeric radiation in the culture at large. But one major way of transmitting the, the legacy of Homer and to alter, alter it in terms of um, new, new identities is another, it can't be ignored. And so you, you have to at least acknowledge that a literary transmission is possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, and by the way, these three things um, happen in the margins of the of uh, smart the smart fools criticisms right he denies they're there he wants to suppress them and he thinks well these things are kind of in the air but there's nothing um, nothing important about it right um, so then you have methodological assaults 
even if such parallels were intertextually mimetic, no criteria can demonstrate it. Again, Litwa, quote, no amount of similarity between texts can prove a genetic connection. Now, that is such a stupid comment by a very bright guy. Um, tell me a biblical scholar who doesn't see that uh, uh, the amount of similarities between the text points to uh, a literary appropriation, or at least an indirect one, uh, flagging a text. Um, this leads simply to an interpretive nihilism. You right. can't ex you can't explain parallels because uh, even if you do have parallels, that you can't make a connection. So, uh, what about marginalization? Uh, even if one were to prove that some parallels with classical Greek poetry are mimetic. They are insignificant blips on the radar. This is a common conclusion in reviews of my work. Whew! The Matrix survives largely unscathed. Yep, I've, uh, that's what I experience, and uh, this discussion is an example of it. So here's my response to skeptics who follow this chain of argumentation. First, no models for literary culture were more popular in the Roman Empire than the Homeric epics. As Quintilian put it to his students, the proper place for be to begin our studies is with Homer. Like his own ocean, which he says is the source of every river and spring, Homer provides the model and the origin of every department of eloquence. At stake here is the satisfaction of my criterion one in Mimesis criticism, the accessibility of the model. So two, I'll have you read this one. Mimesis stood. Mimesis stood at the center of the literary education and production. Quote, the dominant notion in the literary aesthetic among Greek intellectuals in the early Roman Empire was Mimesis, end quote. Philodemus, quote, who would claim that the writing of prose is not reliant on the Homeric poems? Quote, or in quote. At stake here is the satisfaction of Criterion 2 of Mimesis criticism, analogy. That is analogous imitations were these texts targeted for imitation. And one only, need only talk about Virgil. So the Gospels and Acts are populated by anal analogs to Homeric characters and episodes that are so profuse, sequential, and unusual that they must not be ignored. At stake here is the satisfaction of criteria three to five of mimesis criticism, density, order, and distinctive traits. And this okay. is stuff we do with the, with the antecedents to scripture, even to, you know, Old Testament. that come Absolutely. Up yeah. 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 Um, the imitations of Greek of classical Greek literature also are interpretable. Criterion six in many ancient narratives, mimesis enabled, quote, constructing one's own self-representation through and against the canonical past. The literature of Roman Greece engages dynamically with inherited images, tropes, and identities actively constructing a new way of looking at the world by imitating classical Greek poetry, the synoptic evangelist constructed their own new ways of looking at the world. By resisting mimesis criticism is one of many methodologies needed to interpret the synoptic gospels. The disciplinary net matrix we call New Testament scholarship has turned a blind eye to one of the most important and fascinating aspects of their composition. Here's a, an anecdote. I became very good friends at Harvard with one of the most famous of all Homeric scholars, Albert Lord, the author of The Singer of Tales. And um, uh, we became very good friends, and I, I, he really inspired me to take more seriously Homer. But I was really trapped with one of his questions. He said, Dennis, why is it that your field, the study of early Christian texts, says nothing about the most important author of antiquity? And that was the spark that set the flame for me because it was a glaring 
um, omission admitted by one of the great Homeric scholars of our time. And um, I think we really are blind to this, to our own detriment, because this, these authors, by engaging the cultural capital of ancient Greeks, are taking, uh, replacing um, that mythology with what they understand to be a compassionate Jesus and his good news. And if you don't understand that, um, that that's what the motivation is, you really are not understanding these texts. Hmm. There's so much. Um, I hope that our friend, uh, the smart fool, will take it, the constructive criticism, and of course, uh, maybe maybe backpedal a little and say, okay, maybe I didn't know. Maybe maybe there is more to this. Maybe Dennis, Dennis has some good points here. Because what was brought up wasn't, uh, it didn't take down anything. Every every point you just said made plenty of sense. And I, I, I do think it's interesting that none of the parallels were engaged. Um, but then again, if you already discredit based on your assumptions of this literature, then it's easy to dismiss. And again, goes back to your whole, what has happened to you in marginalizing your work? And um, I'm glad to give you this platform. I, it makes oh, yeah. me thank you. Thank well, you. I love your work. You know, it's I think that you're onto something. I mean, if you're wrong about something, you know, you think maybe you might be wrong about some things like whoop de doo But I, there's some things that just are undeniably obvious to me. Let's let's take the example now of the uh, Testament of Abraham. OK, let me share my screen. I'm going to show everybody. I popped this up for everybody who was late in the stream yesterday to show them, but here we are. Um, this is why I chose this text. The Testament of Abraham is written in the same kind of um, register and grammatical limitation that you have in the Gospel of Mark. It's also written in the first century um, of the Common Era, it is written by a Jew, and we're going to see that he's imitating a passage that Mark imitated for the anointing of Jesus. And um, so let's uh, go back and forth in our reading. Okay. So in Testament of Abraham 2-7, to the just Jewish author imitated Homer's account of Eurycleia's recognition of Odysseus and Penelope's dream of the eagle. Oh, and her pet geese, you say. Oh, and her, sorry, and, and pet geese, yeah. Michael the archangel went to Abraham disguised as a young soldier and found the patriarch in his field. Asked him, Abraham asked him, teach me your suppliant. Whence do you come? And from what kind of army? Michael's answer was sufficiently elusive to keep Abraham in the dark. He doesn't want him to know. The two men then set out for a trip, but Michael refused to travel by horse, which set the scene for an obligatory foot washing. On their way, they encountered a cypress tree that spoke as an oracle. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who calls to those who love him. In Odyssey 19, Odysseus referred to the prophetic oak tree at Dodona, which would say when he would return. In the Gospel of Mark, by the way, um, he says, if you want to know the future, go consult the fig tree. Hmm. Now we have these comparative text, a comparative text box, and uh, you know how to do this. I'll read the left-hand side, and you can read the right. I'm waiting. And I, and I hope that your viewers can see the similar uh, wording in Greek. Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, sat across from Penelope for the first time in 20 years. Michael is disguised as a soldier. Penelope says, stranger, I myself will ask you first, whence is your lineage? Where are your parents, uh, city and parents? Abraham, teach me your suppliant, whence do you come and from what kind of army? Odysseus dissimulates because he doesn't want to reveal his identity. Michael obfuscates because he doesn't want to reveal his identity. Okay, when they that, approach the yeah. house, they sat in the courtyard. Penelope, I have an old woman with a wise heart in her breast. She will wash your feet, though she is frail. 
Wise Eurycleia, arise now and come. Bathe this man who resembles your king. Abraham said to Isaac, his son, My child Isaac, draw water from the well. Bring it to me in a bowl so that we may wash the feet of this stranger. For he is weary, having come to us on a long journey. And Isaac, after running to the well, drew and water you can, into the bowl and brought it to them. Yeah, and you can see that the Greek is the uh, same words. Um, so, you know, the author is is uh, really advertising his imitation. So Eurycleia agreed, I will wash your feet. But Eurycleia took the bowl and poured into it lots of water. And Abraham approached and washed the feet of the Ark Strategos. Michael, yeah. the guts of Abraham were moved. Eurycleia um, it, it, it weeps. She cast down tears and Penelope weeps. So sorry for the Greek. And he wept for the stranger. And on seeing his father weeping, Isaac too wept. When Eurycleia recognized Odysseus' scar, she dropped his leg. It fell into the bowl and spilled the water. Oh, you got down low too, down below. Was known as... Oh, yeah, and was known as the Niptra, the washing. When the Ark, the Ark Strategos saw them weeping, he wept with them, and the tears of the Ark Strategos fell into the water for washing, and they became precious stones. When she recognized uh, uh, was known, when she recognized the scar, simultaneously joy and anguish overwhelmed her heart. Both of her eyes filled with tears. When Abraham saw the marvel, he was stunned. She then promised Odysseus that she would keep the news of his return to herself and, and tell no one. Took the stone secretly and hid the secret, keeping it only in his heart. Why don't you read the next to Abraham then? Okay. Abraham then ordered Isaac to prepare a bedroom with linens and a table with wonderful food for the enjoyment of the guests, whose appearance surpasses all human beings. Penelope had given her female slaves the same instructions. When Odysseus refused such hospitality, she said that no stranger ever had come to her home who was as wise. After eating, Abraham, Isaac, and the angelic stranger went to bed. God sent the mention of death into the heart of Isaac as in dreams. Then Isaac, weeping, woke, his father hoping for a final embrace before his death. Michael explained that Isaac had seen a terrifying dream and came to us weeping. And when we saw this, we were too moved and wept. The narrator will say more about the dream later. Um, yes, and uh, the reason that this is, embedded, you can see this uh, this crossbar. Um, I omitted the dream that Penelope has when her husband will return. So uh, I'll read the last paragraph. I think we've, we've okay, exhausted so down here. this. I'll, I'll read it. Surely it is not by accident that Odyssey 19 and Testament of Abraham 2 to 7 both narrate recognitions by hosts that wash the feet of disguised strangers and followed by dreams with symbolism requiring allegorical interpretations. Both dreams involve descending and ascending characters. The eagle represents Odysseus. The luminous man in the Testament uh, represents Michael. And predictions of impending death, the suitors or Abrahams. Now, there is no way to account for those parallels without saying that the author has um, this uh, episode in mind. And it's the same one that Mark uses at about the same time with the same literary register. Now, I'm sure that scholars are, um, my, my critics are going to say, oh yeah, that's going on in the Testament of Abraham, <laughs> but it's not going on in the Gospel of Mark because the Gospel of Mark is protected by theology in a way for Christians that this text is not. I, I do. I think it's important. I brought this up yesterday, but you're here with me, Dennis. Before we go to Q&A, and we're about to do that, I, I think it's really a good thing to bring up Eurycleia, if that's okay with you, and show them, of course, the book, just to tease people for a second here. You should get the book. If you can afford it, it's 27 bucks, and you've put your heart and soul into this book. Mark's Anointing Woman and Homer's Eurycleia. 
Um, did you want me to read? Uh, sure. Go ahead. The woman who anoints Jesus for his burial in Mark surely imitates the famous Homeric niptra, or washing, by Eurycleia, Odysseus' nurse, who recognized the scar on his thigh while washing his feet. Here are the most relevant lines where Penelope speaks to Eurycleia about the renown that comes to those who show hospitality. Quote, If one is noble and of noble heart, strangers carry one's fame far and wide to all peoples, and many speak of one's excellence. Then prudent Penelope said to him, the beggar, Again, dear stranger, never before has a man so prudent of dear strangers from afar come here to my house, so thoughtfully prudent as you are in everything that you say. I have an old woman with a wise heart in her breast who nursed well and cherished that unlucky man. Wise Eurycleia, arise now and come. Bathe this man who is, who is the same age as your lord. And the old woman took the gleaming basin to wash his feet and poured into it lots of cold water and then drew, drew the, the hot. But Odysseus sat at the fireplace. So she approached and began to wash her lord. Immediately she recognized the scar that a boar long ago had gouged with a white tusk. After touching Odysseus's beard, she said, You most surely, surely are, Odysseus, dear child. I did not recognize you before, not until I touched the whole body of my lord. Later, she anointed him richly with oil, Melantho, sister to Melantheus, daughter of Dolios, deceitful, had, a, had complained about Penelope's generosity to the foreign beggar. Odysseus then rebuked her for discrimination against the poor, and Penelope, Penelope accused her of having committed a monstrous act of inhospitality. Here's an image from 440 BC of Eurycleia washing Odysseus' feet as a poor beggar disguised. As Mark's Jesus was eating a woman carrying... Do you want me to continue? No, I think that's enough, probably. Okay, because I know you go down and you get into the boxes and stuff, and we can show parallels. But you're, you're, what you're suggesting is it's <coughs> happening in Mark. It's happening in the Testament of Abraham, which is contemporaneous, approximately, yeah. by a Jewish author, same register type of Greek, and he's playing with Homer. Yeah. Uh, and also, in the Markan account... The, um, it is said that what she has done will be known far and wide, wherever the gospel is preached. The name Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. So um, you, the author wants you to see these parallels. He wants you to see that, uh, that Jesus is, um, is recognized by this woman. And it's to her credit because she understands what the, the, the disciples don't. That is that Jesus must suffer. So I think that let's get to some chats. Okay. Uh, I'm eager to see what people You're think. excited. I, I, from my heart, my guts are moved to use the same language as Testament Abraham. Dennis, I hope that Myth Vision can help bring some vindication to what has been done to you in scholarship for so long. Oh, I you. love yeah. what you do. I love your work. I love what you've spent so long trying to show. And I, it's my goal for others to investigate and look at this and fall in no, love with it as well. You're, you're that very is my sweet. Goal. Thank you. I mean, just being honest. So dual Cranine in the house again, I saw you yesterday, my friend, thank you for the support. A Catholic said, quote, to be steeped in history is to cease being Protestant <laughs> in quote. <laughs> Dr. McDonald's work shows a deeper, what it means shows deeper what it means to quote be steeped in history end quote. <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> that's great that's beautiful yeah steve a in the house thank you so much for the support steve i appreciate that camille gregor man i love this guy camille by the way i think camille's actually working in classics he's going to i think be a beautiful. phd in classics simple greek doesn't rule out knowledge of Greek mythology. We have textbooks and writing exercises in simple Greek about Greek myth. Yep. Um, I don't know these sources, but you might want to read these sources here, Dennis. Um, uh, pr probably Antiquitates Liberalis, um, uh, the uh, pseudo hygienist on astro astronomy, um, uh, Heraclitus uh, on um, Apistone, on uh, the uh, things or unbelievers or, or things that are not, not credible. So Camille is echoing your answer there in response to the critic. Yeah. Thank you, Camille. Appreciate the super chat. 
No cisbrosis in the house. Wouldn't a large amount of indirect influence strengthen the point that these authors were living and breathing in a cultural built culture built on these works? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so that the author can account, can expect that the reader is going to be familiar with this, even though the author sometimes is going to um, have a text uh, to imitate in order to make the point. And our dear friend, Dr. James Tabor said, all academic topics between qualified scholars are fair for discussion and deliberation with respect, not dismissal. Thank you, James. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tabor. Good to see you in the chat, my friend. Yeah. Gettysburg demoniac. Did the pagan influence into Christianity come mainly from the diversity of Judaism in the first century CE or before or from the spread to the Gentiles as the religion was propagated? Good question. Did the pagan influence come mainly from the diversity of Judaism in the first? Um, I, I think it's a, a unfortunate dichotomy. I think that uh, Hellenism was so widespread uh, among so so-called pagans and Jews that it really is very difficult to tease out um, this material. We know that Jews were Hellenized. Uh, already in the second century um, before the Common Era, uh, which is actually earlier than any kind of Roman uh, contact they would have had. So um, it's an interesting question, uh, but I think it, it probably is unanswerable because Hellenism was so widespread. Absolutely. And James was saying that's because Dell is a gentleman. So I think it was in response to when I pointed out Dell kindly said you could be right. And he's just never investigated. That's an honest and a respectable I response. I, I appreciate that very much. 100%. And you can't knock someone who doesn't know, but he at least was honest in that response, not trying to take jabs at you and then dismiss you and then just hand wave you. No, he only knows what he knows, you know, and it's a, it, what I would say it's a smart comment. Yeah. yeah. He's a smart guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, everybody in the chat, hello, love you, welcome. I see multiple people waving and kind of saying hey in the chat. Um, Aries Aurelian, did the Muratorian canon compiled in 8170 remove many of the more blatant ad adaptation and copies of older manuscripts from the Bible? I don't know. Uh, no, I think um, the wisdom on this that I and I haven't investigated it myself directly so much is that the decisions about the Meritorian canon already had been made more or less by that time. But um, you're giving it really quite an early date, and it's difficult to date the Meritorian canon. What I find it to be most fascinating about is that even whenever one dates it, one can see that there is both um, a, 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 a canon, uh, but that there uh, it wiggles a little bit still. Um, and uh, so, for example, Canon Moratori has uh, some of the Jahani literature in a different sequence uh, than we have in the standard New Testament. So um, it's an excellent question, uh, Aries. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for you, um, but I'm pretty dependent on uh, other people who have worked on these things. Thank you, Aris. Thank you for the super chat. Imnag with the 10. Thank you, my friend. Seems to me that fundamentalists don't understand the trauma that comes with deconverting. One, you've been lied to. The other, uh, the other, you're not Christian enough. And three, running the risk of losing family members. Yeah. So. Um, uh, again, I gave my career to the training of Christian uh, leaders. And I tried to <laughs> make sure they didn't lie to people and they uh, didn't try to divide families and they didn't uh, set such a bar that people felt guilty for, um, for not achieving th that righteousness. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Imnag. Camille Greger is back again. Give your critics, uh, your critics an ancient Chinese narrative and tell them to look for Homeric parallels. 
if it's true that you're only seeing things, they should be able to find them there just as easily. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> Camille, I wish they had engaged in actual texts and comparisons because if you choose not to see something, you'll never see it. Uh, you, so if you choose not to see the Homeric uh, text, you're never going to see the parallels that are so really wonderful and fun uh, and meaningful. I don't I don't know how to unsee some of them now. You know, it's pretty obvious to me. Yeah. It's, it's really clear. Um, I guess that's because I've willfully indulged and actually took serious and considered what you said. And your criteria makes a lot of sense. So... Uh, it's not like I just went, oh, let's just look for anything that might look similar. There's a lot more to it than that. Thank you, Camille. William Ahrens, with all uh, with all respect to Dr. McDonald, the Greek influence in the Bible is evident in Job, a book in the form of a Greek play with a protagonist, an antagonist, a chorus of friends, and a deus ex machina. Uh, deus ex machina. Yeah, machina. E exactly. I don't deny that at all, William. Um, uh, I'm not an authority on it, but the uh, the business about Job and the Greeks has been well known, not just because of philosophical uh, sophistication, but also because it is set up almost as a Greek play uh, with the protagonist who is uh, struggling against fate um, and uh, a, a kind of a uh, a, a deus ex machina at the end where God comes in and makes all things right. So I don't deny that for a moment. Thank you, William. I really appreciate that. Thank you for uh, trying to tell people, be sure to like the stream. Uh, let us know you like the stream by hitting the like button and share it. Camille Gregor's back again. I'm going to let you read this one because I don't know the Greek and you might be able to better... Sift this uh, super evidence chat. of Homeric oral transmission in the first century. Plato's Eon makes it seem that Rhapsody were in uh, uh, in decline by the fifth century. Would you say illiterate Trimalchio knew the material only from the recitation of texts? Uh, that's a very learned question. Uh, the Rhapsody uh, are people who memorize the Homeric epics and would perform them in uh, after dinner events or sometimes even in um, uh, in public settings. So, um, and Plato's Eon isn't only the isn't the only place where we see this. And the the work of Gregory Nage is very important in showing how important the oral tradition about Homer continued um, to Pinder and beyond. So, um, I don't think it's an either or. I think that people would be exposed to Homer both on the stage. Although it was in decline um, uh, uh, early on, um, and but it was also uh, known by text, and I think that the 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 best way one would know these stories is probably through education, and to some extent art. Now the illiterate Trimalchio, oh, that's a great uh, and a learned comment, uh, appears in the Satirica or the Satiricon of Petronius. And he botches things up with Homer all over the place. And um, he's a wealthy uh, man who is a total idiot. And um, he botches one mythology after another. And it's not just the Homeric epics, although those are the ones that are most obvious. But it's, uh, it's other uh, material as well. Now, uh, Trimalchio is really um, uh, Petronius' uh, creation. So I'm not talking about the uh, historical Trimalchio. I'm talking about uh, Petronius's Trimalchio. But I think he would have, he, P Petronius would have, ex now Petronius is writing in Latin. But he would expect his Latin readers to know these stories very well because he satirizes them through Trimalchio all the time. 
And so I would say the value of Trimalchio is not a historical question, but it's a rhetorical one. And uh, Petronius expects his readers in Latin to know these stories well enough to, to have an idea of how badly Trimalchio was messing them up. So, so, so let me let me get this straight. He so Petronius wrote in Latin using kind of the Homeric mythology that we see, making it to where uh, where Trimalchio is messing up, but he does it on purpose. So it's a joke. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it's hysterical. It's wow. hysterical. And, and he also brings in um, Platonism. The death of Socrates uh, has uh, issues. Um, Robin Faith Williams actually thinks that there's a connection. Between Robin Faith Walsh. Situ- oh, Walsh, yeah. 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 Um, um, that there's a relationship between the, the satirica or the satiricon. Uh, well, I'll go with either title. Um, and the, the Gospel of Mark. Um, if there is one, I'm convinced that it must go from Mark to this Latin author who's actually parodying, um, giving a parody of it. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. Camille, we got to have you back, man. We got to set something up. Very Um, smart question. Yeah, you can tell he's been uh, learning a lot. So I love uh, learning from him. Thank you, Camille. We got a new member, Mikoy. Forgive me if Micah, Micah Oy. Thank you for becoming a member. Be sure to go check out on the Myth Vision page, I have so many videos you can go watch now that you're a member on the, the YouTube channel. So thank you for joining. Hope you enjoy it. Um, we've got more down here. Trying to get to it. Uh, Chris McCarthy, if you analyze text using mimesis, then you probably know who our Dennis is. He refuses to yield to an obstinate field, for Dennis is their classic nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> a poem on mimesis and nemesis oh my gosh that's beautiful right he's he's making a, a a prose technically this is poetry actually i have a dactylic hexameter that i've created to explain mimesis criticism the gospels seldom relate um things that actually happened. Uh, Rather, they uh, imitate um, the the texts that were uh, available. Actually, I'm botching it myself. (laughs) But uh, it is fun to create your own poetry. Chris, that was beautiful. Thank you, Chris. (laughs) Appreciate that. Super chat. Boris, I don't want to butcher your last name, says, is it possible New Testament writers used mnemonics? mnemonics? Yeah. Loki to remember what they heard said by witnesses or alternatively remembering other ideas mixed them with what's heard and told? Boris, that's a, a fine question. And the there, there are other scholars who are interested in issues of memory. And so it could be that you have, I mean, early Christians talk to each other. Uh, There's no doubt about that, even though we may not have those memories uh, recorded in the Gospels. But uh, you can see what Paul is doing in his letters and uh, communicating things about uh, Christian origins and so on to some extent. Now, um, do you have mnemonics such as uh, loci um, or um, uh, that is uh, kind of stock units to shape the memory. Well, this is what form critics have tried to do with oral tradition. And Dale Allison, whom uh, Derek mentioned earlier, um, is one of the advocates of this kind of memory uh, discourse. Um, So it's very difficult. So I think there are two questions, Boris, and they're they're both um, answer to your very fine question. One is, how did early Christians remember things that they had heard earlier? And the second is, whatever they knew and, and uh, of Christian origins, how much of that is informing the texts that we now have, or how much of it is lost precisely because it is um, it was oral? Now, for me, the most important uh, information we have about 
or early Christian uh, orality is in Papias's um, exposition of Logia about the Lord, which is written around the year 110. And he claims that he enjoyed collecting data from living um, memory. Now, it's not that it's oral tradition that's kind of up there as an abstraction, but in asking people themselves, what do they remember? So it's their personal remembrance. It's not an abstract oral tradition. And uh, often Papias has been misunderstood to uh, be advocating this um, oral tradition and the kind of a form critical assessment. He really is interested in what he calls living voices, uh, people who have their own memories of the apostles or of Jesus. And uh, he's trying to find out what their personal memories were. Now, this um, is a dangerous uh, business because uh, we don't know that uh, we don't have much of Papias, so we don't know what those uh, images were, and we don't know if they were trustworthy, and we know that people can lie about things they experience. So um, it's very difficult to manage, but uh, I wish we had... Uh, I wish we had better access to um, oral tradition, but we simply don't. Thank you, Boris. And then Bar Barbaco, 666, thank you for that super chat. Beyond Job, aren't the Gospels just Greek plays with the resurrection as deus ex machina? They seem with for the stage. Um, uh, Barbaco, I, I think it's better to say that the Gospel of John um, is uh, more attentive to Greek plays um, because you have the famous pro -em, uh, the, the prologue about the Logos, which has, uh, I think I've shown very interesting parallels to um, Dionysus's opening speech in the Bacchae. You have a deus ex machina at the end where Jesus appears to um, Mary Magdalene and uh, sets things right. And she's playing the role of uh, uh, Dionysus's mother, Agave. And you have then, of course, the eating of, uh, of Jesus's flesh and drinking the wine, the changing of water into wine and so on. So there I think you have the Greek play playing an enormous role. But in the synoptics as well, and also in the Acts of the Apostles, we have imitations of uh, Greek plays. So the madness of Heracles by Euripides may inform the story of the frothing demoniac in the Gospel of Mark. We also have uh, the Bacchae influencing the story of Paul in the Acts of the Apostles, and in fact, a quotation from the Bacchae. It's hard for one to kick against the goads. So that's why in my um, title of my synopsis. It's called Synopses of Epic, Homer, Virgil, and so on. Tragedy, and I, by that I mean Athenian tragedy, but I would include other forms of poetry too, Homeric hymns and so on, and the Gospels. So, um, by the way, this is important, Barbaco, and I hope other people understand it. I'm a pioneer, but I have not found all of these parallels. Um, and some of them aren't even convincing so much to me. And I know there are other ones around that I haven't seen. I found one just a, a, a month ago that forced me to add something to uh, my synopsis because I was so embarrassed that I hadn't seen it before. <laughs> so um, this is a... a a hermeneutic that is very much in a prolegomenon stage. So I'm trying to put together some methodology and some uh, give people some glasses, but uh, I'm not the only one that's going to wear these glasses and someone's going to, um, to have a clear idea of how this is going to work. So um, I view my work really as that of a pioneer and I just want to have a lot of settlers on the frontier making better sense of all this. And I think more people will, Dennis. So to recap, not only did you bring in 
you know, the Testament of Abraham, which I've never had you do to discuss that it's the same Greek level of writing. They're, they're playing with Homer. Why, why are we making Mark somehow we're trying to divorce Mark from being able to have done this. You've shown that's not the case. You've gave excellent responses. I think you've been a true gentleman apart from the poisoning of the well that we had to address. I, I wish in the future people would stop poisoning the well when they try to respond to you or even what I'm doing. Yes, I have rhetoric where I am going back at fundamentalist people who are out here trying to wage war ideologically. And yes, I battle back. I don't sit and bend over and just take it. I'm going to fight back because that's what I honestly think is helping people, especially if you see the emails I get. But to give a tease, to give a tease, I'm going to show just as we're going through here, Dennis, your 18 lecture course we did and why people should take this. This one right here, you're talking about the groundbreaking Eureka, so to speak. Uh, you, this is just introduction. But you had Eureka, like your story of how you came to find out this was happening. You talk about Luke's infancy narrative and the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite and interplay of dynastic claims and prophetic language. From Telemachus to Jesus, divine empowerment parallels between the Odyssey and the Gospel of Mark, where Athena flies down to empower Telemachus so that he knows he's the son of Odysseus. He starts doubting he's even Odysseus' son. A dove, the Holy Spirit, flies down, empowers Jesus at the baptism, letting him know what? You are my son. And he, next thing you know, he shoots out to be tempted in the wilderness. This guy's got power. He's ready to face anything, just like Telemachus. Scrolling down, embarking on a journey, Jesus and Telemachus set sail with new ships and crews. If you go read Mark, you're going to see what I'm saying. If you've ever been to the Galilee, you'll look at this, this lake and go, ships? They got, they got a first century boat, and it looks like a canoe. That's not a ship. So uh, anyway, you start to see some interesting parallels on what they're doing with this narrative. The bag of winds and the calming of the sea. Both Jesus calms the sea, Aeolus with the bag of winds. Anyway, legion of demons encountering the savages who live in caves. It's one of my favorite ones. Talking about the pigs uh, who get the legion of demons entering them and how Polyphemus, books 9 and 10, I think it is, or 10 and 11, and uh, the witch uh, who actually turns the soldiers into pigs to eat them, but doesn't do it to Odysseus. Anyway, parallels there, right? This continuing. From the Iliad to the gospel, healing the blood wounds. Not only are you showing there's a similarity between what happens with a soldier who has a wound that stinks and that has black blood in the Iliad, but also Jesus, when he heals the woman who, who had the blood that kept coming from her. She touches his, uh, what do you call that? The tassel and ends up getting healed. Ancient readers, ancient Christians in the Homeric Chintones recognize this as well. All of these are videos, by the way. If you sign up for the course, you'll own it for life and you can always reference this. We're only on lecture eight now. Beheading noble men, symbolism and violence in Mark's gospel and Greek mythology. I believe this is where the beheading of John the Baptist and what happens with their feast, Herod's feast and giving, who was it? The it's, isn't it one of his family members or something like that? Agamemnon and uh, Clytemnestra. Okay. So there's the parallel between what's going on here and what's happening with John the Baptist feeding the multitude, the tell of two feasts. Both of them are feeding a multitude. Of course, Jesus is going to come out looking better. Daring to defy, walking on water with divine power. Not only did Hermes walk on water and Jesus walked on water, but so did Mercury in Virgil. So you have several deities and Jesus just has to outdo them. The radiant glory comparing the transfigurations of Jesus and Odysseus. Jesus transfigured. You have Moses's face shine, but not his garments. But when you go and look at Odysseus, his garments transform. So you got to watch the video to start, you know, diving in. Unquenchable desires, Tantalus and the rich man in Hades. Got to check this out. This is uh, lecture 12. Victorious homecomings, the remarkable triumphal entries of Jesus and Odysseus. Look at the parallels there. 
The Power of Feminine Devotion, a study of two anointings by women. This is exactly what we covered today. The anointing by Eurycleia, or the washing of, of Odysseus, which was seen as somewhat of an anointing, and Jesus before his death, of course, by the woman who's re renowned far and wide. Martyrs of Different Worlds, a study of Jesus and Hector's final moments, the death of Jesus, the death of Hector. Jesus comes out looking better. Risking Everything for Closure, a study of Joseph of Arimathea and Priam of Troy. Joseph rescues the body of Jesus after his death. Priam rescues the body of his son, Hector, after his death. Um, you got to watch this. You got to go there and sign up. Mystery Solved, the Homeric connection of the naked young man. Everyone wants to understand the naked young man. Who is this naked young man running away? Dennis has an explanation using Greek, the Greek words and uh, the Greek works. And then, of course, Lecture 18, Wounds That Reveal, Understanding the Identity of Odysseus and Jesus Through Their Scars. 18 lectures, lots of content, high quality. We take you through the book in these lectures as well. I hope you get a copy of his book. But if for some reason you're in another country and you can't access it right now, you can access it through the visuals of the course. We literally go through it and we're reading it and we're literally showing you what's in there in these passages as they parallel. So you're able to actually follow along with the parallels and me and Dennis just have a hoot. I mean, I loved editing this video, this whole course. Dennis, I really loved it. And I, I figured why not really get people to see what they'll get if they take the course? Well, thank you. Beautiful. Uh, let me just say a word about where my work is going right now. I'm about to release a book on the Q document. And I mentioned it before, Homer and the quest for Q and Jesus, which sounds ironic, but it really is a help. But I'm also planning to do four audio books that are based on the synopses. Um, the one on Q, one on the synoptics, um, one on... Um, it, Oh, but no, one, one on the Odyssey, one on the Iliad, and one on Greek poetry otherwise. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, the, so I've got my, I'll probably die before I get all this done. You know, I have a 77th birthday coming up next month. So uh, we'll see. But uh, Take care uh, of yourself, Dennis. I want you yeah. to be around for a while longer if I can. Yeah. Seriously, I mean, you have a masterpiece full of insights that I'll always be combing through, but uh, give us another decade at least, you know? I'd okay. like that. I'd like that too. Thank you, every everybody. Thank you, Dennis, for taking your time. I hope that the, uh, what is it, the smart fool um, appreciates and enjoys what we did today. Maybe, maybe they feel like you've made them uh, cautious about the, the positions they held against your work. I don't know. Cause they, they seemed like they really were seriously inquiring. Like they really wanted to know if you were right, but it seems that they came to a conclusion that just was antagonistic to your work because they found they were convinced that, Oh, well, Mark's not, you know, writing on that level. Mark must be socially marginalized and not elite. Therefore he couldn't have known this mythology or something. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Let me say this, though, to, uh, to the smart fool. You're smart. And you're not a fool. But I think that you're blinkered. And there's more in classical literature, especially poetry, that I think you would have fun with with your smarts. Mm. So um, I don't think you're a fool. Yeah, but I think, uh, uh, but I think your erudition needs to um, be broader, and I'd be eager to hear um, what you have to say about that. Dennis, wonderful words. I agree. I he named himself that, which is no. I, I agree. played. Yeah. I played with the title and thumbnail, but uh, yeah, Smartful, please email me, message me, let me know what you think about this episode, or write in the um, in the. Uh, reddit post i'll be happy to see what you think of the episode i hope you enjoyed it everybody hit the like button um help support the community what we're doing here at myth vision we have all the links in the description get dennis's book sign up for the course that also helps dennis out and uh never forget we we 
our, our myth vision. vision. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more.